you look at the newspapers today and you're watching your news channels in the morning, it's quite a different picture. And in fact, the Arab, the Arab world is a bit synonymous with conflict and strife and political unrest. Now, when I came back to the UAE after my studies to start work, both as a veterinarian and more so as a scientist for my country, I realized I wasn't happy with this image. And I decided to go and find the science that I was so passionate about in our people. And this is what I found. A vacuum, an emptiness, a, a complete nothing. And if there are any other scientists here that are looking into the Arab world, they'll identify with me. So I said, OK, that's not going to cut it. I'm going to dig this up. I'm going to look for it. And I started my journey. Now, it was mid-2012 where I found myself in this office, on the other side of the planet, actually, in the USA. This is the office of the director of remote sensing for Boston University in Boston, Massachusetts. Now, the significance here is I went to go and ask him some questions. And this person actually happens to be Dr. Farouk Al-Baz, an Egyptian, an Arab. Now, saying his name here, I wonder if anybody knows who this man is and what he's done for the modern world, okay? As a young geologist, he worked for NASA. And he told me while I was in the office about the story of when he used to watch all these scientists at NASA present ideas, topics, thoughts, really forward thinking. And as a young Egyptian amongst all these peers, he thought, okay, I don't really have much to say here. And while wandering around NASA, he came upon a huge room, almost the size of this place. And he walked in and found hundreds of thousands of photos. The photos that NASA had been collecting and been dumping in this room. And it was in complete disarray. So he went back to his supervisor and he said, hey, look, I found all these pictures. Wonder if I could uh, take a look at them. He's like, look, do whatever you want, but it's, it's a mess in there. And over a series of months, he began to catalog that whole room. And I think it was about six months when he came out working more than 12 hours a day in that room. He presented to this group that he'd watched previously. And he presented them with an idea that if you were to ever land on the moon, these would probably be the best places to do it. Well, the rest is history. And in that office, dumbstruck by his contribution to where man is today, he did turn around and say to me, it's like, look, there is something that you, your generation has to do. It's where my generation failed. And, you know, my call to duty, let's do it. What is it? He's like, you have to unite the Arab world. Okay, sure, I'll put that on my to-do list. <laughs> but leaving his office that afternoon, I'm walking away with new purpose, more motivation to really hunt down the, the real gold mine of, of, of my quest. And fast forward mid-2013, and my wife comes back from a women's award, um, and she's a judge on the panel. And she comes back, and she's in a flurry, and she says, look, Manjit, you have to go and look up this woman that I've met. I said, who is this? She says, her, not, her name is Dr. Manaha Thabit. Now, I looked her up. She's a Yemeni woman. She's an Arab. And she happens to have an IQ of 168. Now, to put that in perspective of the world, she sits in the top 0.1%. She's one of the smartest people you will ever be lucky to meet. Now, it doesn't just end there. She actually has two PhDs. And get this, the first PhD is in financial engineering. Financial engineering where she worked with a consulting company that she set up to help companies come out of the crisis of 2007 and 2008. And as if that wasn't enough, her second PhD is quantum mathematics. And with a 350-page proof 
formulas, numbers, and symbols. She's proven how you can measure distance in space without even using light as a base measure. Now, that is an incredible, incredible amount of Arab, Arab science, if you ask me. And I found out yesterday when I was paying attention to the numbers that she's not really much older than I am, so <laughs> make me think twice about what I'm doing. So come to mid this year and I'm commuting to work and I'm listening to my podcast. And I come upon a story about a professor at Princeton and he is a Lebanese man, he's an Arab, and he's literally a rocket scientist. He does plasma physics. But in his spare time, when he's not literally sending people to the moon, he is dabbling in audio, in audio frequencies. He's actually pioneered a technique where he uses only two speakers to create real 3D sound by modulating frequencies on what reaches your ear. So that's great, right? We've got the scientists found this vacuum to actually be full of scientists. And there are more, there are so many stories, but if you're talking about innovation, the scientists alone really can't generate everything. In fact, the scientists here want to do the work, but how are you going to be able to get there? And then, well, as we've heard, you need some help. On the x-axis here, we have R&D as a percentage of gross domestic product. That's how much are you putting in, in terms of R&D to your GDP. And here on the y-axis, you've got science, scientists and engineers per million. That is your population, and how many percentage of them are actually in the science and engineering field. And what you get here is the forecast for 2007. And you can see US dominate China, Japan, and then the European countries. But the color, the color I'm looking at is green. This represents Middle East and Africa. The few green dots up there represent the whole of Middle East and Africa. Israel, well, their political situation dictates this. But Qatar have stepped to it. But last year's, last year's report, or the 2013 report, didn't even have Qatar up there. And then the only other Arab country really here is Saudi Arabia. But if you ask me, Iran is, in my opinion, part of that group. And there you have it. That's about as much as we're doing at the moment. And, and this was really upsetting, but I know we have, we have our work cut out for us. And like an answer to my prayers, on the October 14th of this year, the UAE government announced their national innovation strategy. And this really, this got my juices going. They're talking about education, renewable energy, they're talking about water, transport, and even space. Yeah, space, the UAE in space, that's, that's great. So, there we go, we've got our scientists and we've got the government back. And Noah and I are in total agreement, we're going in the right direction. But what concerns me is that these scientists alone really aren't going to just innovate in their box. In fact, I was part of the innovation seminars and workshops for that innovation strategy on part of the environment. And I remember somebody looking at me going, think outside the box. Well, you know what? It's not easy on command, I've tried. And I believe if you want to think outside the box, you need to engage with outside the box. You need to be speaking to the people that live and breathe outside the box. Artists, designers, entrepreneurs, enthusiasts, people that are not formally trained but have a passion. Children. I mean, some of the most brilliant ideas come from children because they, they just do away with the crap and they just tell you what they mean. And yes, teachers. Teachers have to adapt these new ideas and feed them back. And it's that dialogue that we need for real innovation. This, this catalyzes innovation. But that vacuum is still here. That vacuum is what shrouded 
this whole conversation from me, from the other scientists here in the region. There are, I've heard of people that come back here, realize that they don't know where to work or what they can do as scientists. And then they book it. And they go to the US. They go to other countries. And that's a very dangerous formula. So in the beginning of this year, an idea had started to build momentum in my mind. And I started talking to some people that are actually present in this room, and they know what this is about. And I wanted to break this gap. I wanted to cross this vacuum and reach out and really bring the scientists and the science to the people and the people to the science. And we call that the MENA scientist. I want to build a platform that is going to showcase our heritage and our current innovation in science. It's going to be a place where scientists can go to find each other, to go find work, and to go and connect with other people. It's going to make science digestible. And the problem is that science has become a very black and white, you know, I published a paper. Those things are boring to read. And I know I've sat through a few of them. And I've written my own thesis, and I didn't enjoy the process, but hey, that's me. So what I'm looking to do is to create something through multi multimedia and many mediums to reach out to you, to make it digestible. Now, we have a lot of things planned for the MENA scientist. And as my son, my first son, was born on September the 10th, I felt I had to start. I couldn't wait for us to have it ripen. And so I'm out there. I've started. And so you can engage with Amina Scientist. The most fundamental point I'm trying to get here is that we need to bring the emotion and the color back into science. We need to bring it into the, the conscience of people. We need it to be right here in the front of their minds when they're talking to other people. It needs to be part of our everyday conversation. Now, how we get there? Well, we go back to our history. And one of the, the, the greatest things we're known for as Arab people is not just science. There's something else. It's storytelling. Everybody talks about the narrative. Well, I've told you a little bit about my journey through here. And each one of those scientists has a journey. They have triumphs. They have failures. And they have challenges. And they endeavor. You guys sit in cinemas watching a lot of fiction, science fiction, which I'm a fan of, but where is the reality? Where are the people that are really fighting the good fight for science, for innovation, for the better world? We're lucky to have had some of these people here on the stage, and I've been a bit fired up. But really what would give me more pleasure than anything is that if one day you would join me for once upon a time in a lab. Thank you very much.